Luke chapter 9. And uh, just while you're finding that, um, let me just give you a reminder of the situation that Jesus um, is part way through, about halfway really, through his earthly ministry. His earthly ministry lasted approximately three years, and we're now at about the 18 month mark. And uh, as he gets to that point, and as he went into year two, uh, Jesus spent some time with his father up on the mountainside. And as he came down from the mountainside, you may recall that at that point he called together his huge flock of disciples that had been following him around. And he picked out uh, from them, uh, he picked out 12, he designated them apostles, uh, and uh, apostles means sent one. So he picked them out deliberately, giving them a new title. You're no longer just disciples. You're a, a particular uh, breed of disciple now. You are the apostles. You are the sent ones. So they couldn't imagine that for the rest of their time with Jesus, they were just going to be following him. There comes a point, says Jesus, when uh, you don't ever stop following Jesus exactly, but... Uh, instead of only just coming after him, you then go out for him. Uh, and uh, that's this point here. So this is probably uh, a few months after Jesus has handpicked those 12 uh, and uh, he's given them some specific training. He took them on a little mission, in fact. Uh, if you read through the Gospels, you'll find that after he picked them, he then went around to the towns and the villages and as he went around there, he was preaching the good news. He was casting out the demons. He was healing the sick. And then we come to chapter 9. And uh, let's pick up the story. Uh, chapter 9, verse 1. And when Jesus had called together, uh, or the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases, and he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he told them, take nothing for the journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra tunic. Uh, whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. If people do not welcome you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave that town as a testimony against them. And so they set out and they went from village to village, preaching the gospel and healing people everywhere. Well, that is our passage today um, that we started looking at last week. So perhaps um, I better just give you uh, a quick recap. I know that some of you weren't here last week and... Uh, probably, um, let's be honest, most of the rest of us have forgotten what I said last week. Um, so uh, it's probably a good thing just to, to do a quick uh, reminder of all of that. Well, we've said a little bit about the background and how we came to this position of Jesus sending out the twelve. Um, uh, Matthew says that he sent them out uh, in twos. Um, and uh, so... I think it's Matthew, it might have been Mark, but anyway, one of them records that he sent them out in pairs, um, so they weren't just going out individually or as a, a large group of 12, but he split them up. So we have these six um, pairs that are going around from town to town, village to village, and they are just mimicking the very things that they have seen Jesus do. Now, up to this point, Jesus has been doing all the ministry himself. And that this is uh, where there is a massive change in the ministry strategy and style. It was Jesus that was doing all the preaching. It was Jesus uh, who was healing the sick. Jesus raising the dead. It was Jesus who was casting out the demons. It was all Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And the followers were quite happy to go around and support him and uh, to uh, you know, stand with him and and be assistance to him as, as he did that. Um, but Jesus says, this can't go on forever. That was never the purpose. He says, I've done this. I've shown you how to do it. 
And now you are to go, and you've got to go and do the same thing. And so Jesus takes these 12, and we looked at why there were 12. We'll come on to that in a moment. Um, and he takes them, very significant that he takes the 12 uh, at this time, and he sends them out into Israel. A little later on, he was to pick um, a, a bigger number, um, uh, and uh, 72. Uh, and he sent them out uh, um, doing the same thing. Um, but why the 12? Let's, let's just quickly look at that because it is important and very significant. 12 is, is a significant number in Scripture. It appears uh, quite early on in your Bible. You'll find that there is a significant um, uh, uh, number 12 that comes up. And, of course, it was the fact that um, uh, um, uh, Jacob had his, his sons who became the 12 tribes of Israel. And the whole purpose of the tribes of Israel was that they were to be God's chosen people in order to take the good news that God had for the world out to the world. They were to be the model nation. And so God sent uh, this, this whole nation, the 12 tribes, and he sent them out uh, to live uh, in the center of all the peoples around them. And he said, now I want you to worship me. And to serve me, you are to be holy as I am holy. Uh, you are to only do the things that are right and good and proper. And he forbade them uh, to do the things that the nations around were doing. They were not allowed to uh, get into idolatry. Um, uh, they were to serve the Lord and him alone. They served a jealous God who would not share his glory now, as you probably know, that Israel didn't serve God wholeheartedly. And uh, as a result of that, they actually um, uh, were apostates. They turned away from the Lord and they did all kinds of things that they shouldn't do. And God had to take them to task over this. And that is the reason why God allowed his chosen people to go into captivity. And you remember... Um, that um, first of all, uh, as the nation of Is Israel was split, uh, so you had the northern, the southern kingdom, and the northern kingdom of Israel went first under the Assyrians, and Sennacherib uh, conquered them, and he took them away. And uh, later on, about 150 years later, the southern uh, um, kingdom, Judah, uh, two tribes basically, uh, um, they were also taken into captivity by Nebuchadnezzar of the Babylonians. And this was God's judgment and punishment upon them because they had not served him faithfully. Uh, and he says, you've not been the model nation that you were meant to be. And as a result of that, he says, I've got to bring you back to me. See, that's the whole point about discipline, is that it is supposed to make uh, the person think, or in this case, the nation think about what they had done. And you know that anyone who's had children, for example, uh, you know that uh, sometimes a child will do something that's wrong and you have to impose some discipline. What's the purpose of the discipline? Is it just to, you know, um, exert retribution on them for what they've done? No, although you might sometimes feel like that, but that's not really the purpose of it. The purpose of it is to correct them so that they might think about what they've done wrong and not make that mistake again. And God did the same with the nation of Israel. He says, you know, if you want to go and, and worship other gods, well, then you might as well go to the other gods. You can serve under them. And they were taken off into captivity. Now, the northern kingdom, of course, never truly formed again. Judah did the southern kingdom. And in Jesus' day... Essentially, what you've got is the southern kingdom, Judah, hence Judea. And the northern kingdom, or, or those that could find any uh, records, well, they couldn't really find any records, but who, who had any claim to being Israel, they, they came and they formed another little nation called the Samaritans. Um, but they were considered to be not pure Israel. Their blood was mixed with that of the nations. Why am I telling you that? Because when Jesus picked 12 individual men and appointed them to be apostles, the sent ones, 
for his kingdom, the new kingdom that he was ushering in, he sent a stark message to the nation of Israel. And this would not have been lost, particularly on the leaders of Israel, the Pharisees, the priests, and the teachers of the law. They knew the significance of the number 12. And so when Jesus picks 12 and says, now I'm sending you as the leaders of my kingdom out to take the good news, they knew that this was a sign of God's judgment upon them, for they had failed to take the good news of the kingdom themselves, even to their own people, let alone to the nations around. And so Jesus says to them, first of all, I want you to go only to Israel. Don't go uh, out to the Gentile nations. He says, stick with the lost sheep of Israel. Go to them first, because he says, this is a judgment message. And as you go about, and they will laugh at you to begin with, and they will scorn you, and they will just think you're, 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 you're just, you know, no hopers. But he said, let me tell you that the same power and authority that was given to me in order to demonstrate and to prove that I was sent by the Father to this world as the Messiah, I am now giving to you. Now you go and you preach the kingdom and you prove that you are authorized to do so. How? By healing the sick and casting out the evil spirits. He says, because that's the sign. Nobody can do that. Nobody can heal. Nobody can cast out the demons unless they've got the power of God in them. And so he says, this will be the sign to them. They will know that you've been sent by God, and this will be a judgment message upon the nation of Israel. And so the twelve went and they did just that. Later on in Luke chapter 22, Jesus tells his twelve apostles that you will sit on thrones judging the nation of Israel. He says, you will become the tribal heads, if you like. You are being, going to be the ones by which, he says, that um, uh, I will exert my authority over the nation. You will be their judge. Because you've listened to me. You've obeyed me. Um, now, we as the church today are an extension of what Jesus began here because um, Jesus' intention was not just to go to the lost sheep of Israel. It was only his intention at this particular point for this mini mission to go to them. But in the future, he says, I want you to go to all people. And so hence, later on, when he comes to the Great Commission, he tells them to go and to preach the good news everywhere. He says, I want you to go out, he said, to um, Jerusalem, to Judea, to the Samaritans, and to the ends of the earth. And he says, you take the good news to them all. And um, so God's purposes and plan was made good uh, in the end. Now, last time we began to look at um, the seven areas that we see here and that I've picked out from Luke chapter 9 uh, of things that Jesus did and taught and and. Uh, seven points we can pick out. Now, we only got through points one and two. We looked at, first of all, that they were assembled for a purpose, and we just covered that about being the 12 who were going to be the, the sign of God's judgment. Um, then they were empowered, so we've just kind of recapped on that as well, that Jesus gave them authority to exercise the evil spirits and to miraculously heal the sick. And so... We now want to pick up on the third point today, uh, which is that they were commissioned. And um, Jesus sent them, uh, say, in pairs. It's Mark 6, um, verse 7. He sent them in pairs to announce the kingdom uh, and to heal the sick. And uh, so there was this twofold thing that they had to do, and we find it here um, uh, in uh, this passage here, as he sends them out, he says, um, uh, you know, I want you to go out there. He says, I'm giving you authority. You're going to drive out the demons. You're going to cure the diseases. 
um, as you go and preach the kingdom. So he says, what I want you to do, basically, he says, I am now commissioning you. He says, uh, I, I am putting you into use, uh, into practice, that you will go out there with this uh, incredible message. And I say, um, and, and the point was that, you know, it was going to be verified uh, by these uh, signs and wonders that they performed. And so the signs and the wonders that they performed um, were, I mean, it's a twofold reason there, really, and, and I know we touched on this last week, so I won't um, uh, over push this point. But as they announced the kingdom, um, say, you know, there's an awful lot of people who will uh, say, uh, who are you to tell us what to do? Um, we get that all the time, even in everyday life. If somebody comes along with a message, particularly one that's, that seems quite strong and might seem overbearing on us and, and uh, not, uh, not the kind of things that, that we want to submit to, we'll ask the question, you know, who gave you the authority to tell me what to do? And Jesus said, if anyone comes up with that argument, either uh, you know, literally challenging you or even in their hearts, he says, we would demolish that as you heal the sick. He says, because everyone knows that actually, and particularly in his day, um, you know, there was medicine, but it wasn't very effective. Um, so there were a lot of sick people around, a lot of people who had some really, really serious illnesses. We're not talking common colds here. And he says, I want you to go around and you are to demonstrate that as you, as you lay hands on, as you, you heal the sick people. Okay, um, number four. I want you to notice that um, uh, now we're, we're, going, we're turning from what they were going to do to how they did it. And one of the first things that we notice here is that they were unburdened. Look at verse three. He told them, uh, take nothing for the journey. No staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra tunic. Um, take nothing with you. Now, I don't know about you, but if ever I go on a journey, particularly if I'm going to be away for, I was going to say, uh, you know, a day or two, but these guys, well, they were going away for several weeks, if not maybe a few months. Um, if you were going to be going away for a few months, I wonder what preparations you might make. Uh, we're coming up to holiday season, and uh, I hope that some of you will get the opportunity to pack your bags and um, uh, go and, and uh, enjoy some, some summer weather somewhere. Um, however, um, I wonder what happens when it comes time for going away. I wonder... I wonder how many of you have got that, that suitcase open and piles and piles of everything you need laid all around you and, and you end up you know, actually sitting... Margaret, you have a very guilty look on your face now. It's, it's <laughs> um, uh, piles and piles of stuff all around you. You're trying to fit it in there and, and you know, uh, maybe I'll take three of those, not two. and better make that four of those, I think. And, you know, and all these extra things that you start throwing in there and, you know, and you end up kind of sitting on top of the suitcase and, you know, jumping up and down on it, whatever you do, um, to get it all in. Um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's great when you, you, you're driving down uh, the motorway or even just down here, down on the A3 in the summertime. And, uh, you know, as soon as school holidays hit, very often I'm driving down and you can just look around and you know which cars have people who are going on holiday. It's quite easy to tell, isn't it? Um, you know, I mean, there is stuff absolutely, I don't know how they see to drive, honestly, because it's piled up to the roof and it's all around, you know, and it's, it's sometimes, you know, on the roof as well. Um, and, and it's everywhere. Uh, all the stuff that we take on us for a journey. And I wonder how many of you, if, if you're anything like me, when you actually get back home, and I'm actually quite a light packer, okay, in, in, in my humble opinion, okay, I'm a light packer, um, compared to Lisa anyway, but don't tell her, all right. So, um, but, you know, when I get back from holiday, I've still got a whole lot of stuff that I never even took out of the bag. You know, I mean, never used it. 
um, and thinks, so why did I take that with me anyway? But I'll take it just in case. We like to be prepared for any and every eventuality. Um, and there's nothing wrong with actually being prepared. Um, that, that's quite a good thing in many respects. And yet Jesus says here for the mission, I want you to go unburdened. He says, I don't want all the extra baggage. Now, I think for them, he was talking literally. Um, uh, he wasn't just talking metaphorically, as we might try and do today, spiritualize it. But he was talking about literally, he says, I don't want you to go burdened with all these extra things, because these will weigh you down. Remember that these guys are on foot, they're walking. They're not putting it in the back of the car. They're not even sticking it on the, you know, on a horse or something like that, you know, or a donkey and, and carrying it. They're having to carry it all themselves. And if you've ever carried, um, uh, you know, a, a backpack or anything, um, uh, you know that it doesn't take long before it starts to feel really heavy if you're going on a long walk, particularly if you're on rough, uneven ground. It's a bit hilly in places. The more weight you carry, the more tired you become. And so he says, go unburdened. Instead, he says, I'm not asking you to do without. He says, I'm asking you to rely on me. I'm sending you. I'm sending you, therefore I will supply what you need. You're about my work. So you don't bring what you think you need. I'll give you what you need for the task. And the amazing thing is that for these guys, that when they eventually came back from their uh, mini mission, not one of them complained that, um, uh, you know, actually, Jesus, we didn't get what we needed. We've come back hungry. Um, and, uh, you know, when they came back, you know, there wasn't kind of like, uh, you know, my goodness, when did you last change that shirt? I mean, go, go away from me, will you? Um, nothing like that at all. Uh, what they're actually say when they came back was, wow, we were just amazed at what happened. That everything that you said would happen, Jesus, did happen. We are uh, stunned by the way in which you've been working through us. And so he says, rely on me. And, and I think there's a principle there for us when we go into mission. Uh, if we're going out now, I mean, that might be quite literally some people might be called to go out and to take the good news of Jesus to another community somewhere. And uh, if, if that's your calling, that, that's a wonderful thing. Uh, for some of us, it's right where we are. But whichever way it is, we tend to get over-prepared ourselves and so there's nothing wrong with being prepared but rely on God a bit more as well to say to him Lord you know I don't want to be cumbered down with with the cares of this world and all the things that I think we need and etc but I just want to be satisfied with what you give me and you will see the glory of God at work and uh, that's an important principle of ministry is that we rely on the Lord Many times, uh, you know, and I could give you story after story, and I will refrain from doing so today. Um, but I could give you lots of stories of where we've had nothing, and we've been trying to achieve something in ministry, and the Lord has provided just at the right time. Uh, and it's not because we went out there saying, worrying, how are we going to do this? How are we going to get this in place? And God, we just leave that with the Lord. We just pray about it and say, Lord, you know our needs and the needs are met. So um, really important principle here is that we go unburdened because that way we can concentrate on the mission rather than on the baggage. Another thing that Jesus says to uh, his disciples is that they are to seek peaceful people. And uh, so you'll find that having gone on their journey and they're going from village to village and they're taking the good news and they're preaching probably in the marketplace um, and uh, that's where the people were gathering so they went where the people were and they began to preach to them and he, Jesus says what you'll, you'll discover is that there will be some people who will welcome you and others who will reject you some people will walk away and or may just mock you 
and others will want to hear more of you. And so they will say, please come to my house. Now, there weren't really many um, hotels around. I mean, hotels didn't really exist much. I mean, there were some traveling inns. I mean, we know that in the nativity story, there was no room in the inn. We talked a bit about um, uh, the Far Eastern and, and Middle Eastern inns uh, at Christmas time. And uh, they were usually arranged in a, a square kind of uh, shape with a courtyard in the middle. And uh, in there would be a feeding troughs for the animals. And so you could bring your, your animals inside where they would be safe through the gate uh, into the center courtyard. And around the outside would be the accommodation. Um, but these guys haven't got any money. How on earth are they going to afford that even if they find one of these merchants' inns? That's what they really were. They were for traveling salesmen. Um, and uh, some believe actually that they were probably more akin to a brothel actually than an inn. Um, and that the traveling salesmen had to, um, shall we say, entertain themselves at night. Um, and so they used to go to these places. But these guys, I mean, they're not going to go to, to there. I mean, so they can't afford it anyway. So. That's not a possibility. So how else did people survive? Well, sometimes they used to literally sleep in the marketplace, in the, the town square, if, if you like. Um, and they would just keep on the floor there. Um, and others would find hospitality with locals. And it was quite common to show hospitality. It was one thing that Israel was good at. They looked after each other. It was part of their covenant with one another. And so Jesus says, look for the homes of peace. When somebody invites you to go to their home and stay, he says, go to their home. Accept what they're giving you because, in a sense, he's saying, this is what I'm providing for you. So you go in. Verse 4, whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. Now, the problem is that sometimes we get invited to the first house and uh, when we get there, um, we discover that it's, uh, you know, it's a little bit shabby and um, uh, you know, the plumbing's not working particularly well, um, the hot water isn't very hot and uh, the room's a bit sort of pokey and the light's not very good and all that. And then suddenly somebody uh, sees us the next day and says, you're staying there? I mean, with that family, and they're all a bit squeezed in, and, and all the rest of it. And you know, here I am in this massive mansion, and, and I've got, you know, six spare bedrooms with ensuite and all the rest of it. And what would you do? I mean, would you be tempted to make, you know, I'm a burden to this family. Let me go. Jesus says, don't do that. Don't, oh, no, that's tempting. But he says, that's an insult on the family that's just taking you in that you've gone to somebody who can give you better. And of course, the thing is that sometimes that we're looking for the comforts to better ourselves. And Jesus says, be satisfied with what I give you. And it's a good training ground to just be humble and accept whatever's on offer. And so it's a sign of their welcome to you and your blessing upon them. In fact, Jesus tells them in another place that when you go in, give your blessing upon the house. And if it's accepted, if they accept the message that you're bringing, stay there. And if they won't listen and if they reject it, that's when you move on. So how do we do that? We also seek peaceful people. You won't always find that everybody's already a believer. You're going out with the gospel, so don't expect that. But instead, find people who are open to the gospel, who will welcome you. Now, you might not need accommodation for the night and to have to stay with somebody. But it might be just that it's a friendship that you strike up, that somebody that you know, that you, you are able to share with when they, they hear your message, then develop that friendship. And so it gives you more opportunity to live your life before them, let your light so shine before men that they will see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. It will be an opportunity to share with them. And there will be others who will reject you. And um, they really won't want to know. And, and he's not saying that you have to give up on those people because there are an awful lot of people that you know, particularly within our families, 
Um, remember, friends, you can choose families you're stuck with. Um, and there are people within your family that uh, will reject your message. Does that mean you have to turn your back on your family? Well, not exactly. Not exactly. Um, I think there comes a time when even in families where you just have to say, I'm not going to waste the valuable message anymore. Um, but instead, what he's saying is, I believe for us today at least, how we would apply the principles here is that, that, that when somebody rejects us, turns their back on us, don't waste valuable time and effort trying to get through to them. Leave your message with them and then leave them alone. Um, have you noticed that if you've got a particularly antagonistic person who doesn't want to know, the more that you say to them, the more it seems to fuel their antagonism. It's better just to, to uh, as it, Jesus says, let your peace return to you uh, and walk out. That, you know, in itself is a sign to them. And the other thing is that all the time that you are putting lots of effort into that person who keeps rejecting and rejecting and rejecting, that you're losing time with somebody who's ripe and ready to hear. Now, I know that somebody will come uh, and um, verbally accost me later and say, but I've been praying for somebody for years and years and years. Should I stop? Um, or they'll come with that story of that I prayed for years and years and years for somebody who was really anti and eventually they found Christ. How can you say that? And I know that there are those stories and I, I don't want to belittle that at all. I'm just telling you these are the principles Jesus is laying down for his mission. Um, there, there will be people that God lays on your heart. I'm not saying give up praying for them if God's laid them on your heart. I'm saying that as far as our um, purposeful mission goes, don't spend a lot of time with people trying to establish links if they're turning their back constantly on you. Okay, so seek the people of peace. Um, it's a universal message. I want you to notice that they went uh, and ministered everywhere. Um, so in verse 6, the very last line, it says, um, that they were preaching the gospel and healing people everywhere. They went around from town to town. They didn't discriminate and just, they're walking, uh, leaving one town, going to the next one. And, and as they came, they said, ah, oh, do you know what? We don't really want to go to this one. Let's bypass that one and we'll move on to the next one. They went to the next group of people and to the next group of people and to the next group of people. And there is a sense in which, as we are called to go about our mission, is that we're not supposed to bypass people, but we're supposed to go along and say, you know, to the next group and the next group and the next group. Um, I heard a quote um, uh, this week, and uh, I am kicking myself because I cannot remember which spiritual giant said this. Um, but I think it may have been um, George Muller. But um, you better not quote me on that one. Uh, but it was somebody of, of that kind of era and, and that kind of stance. And, and uh, uh, in case you don't know about George Muller, he was an incredible Christian. Um, uh, he was uh, originally uh, from, from Germany, but he came and he worked and he ministered in Bristol uh, in this country. And he set up a children's home. He was a tremendous man of faith uh, and saw... Uh, uh, hundreds and hundreds of children, orphan children, that he supported, uh, um, mainly by faith, um, as he did that. And, uh, but he said this, or somebody like him said this, never let 15 minutes pass in a conversation with someone without me mentioning Jesus Christ to them. Um, I wonder how many times that we've had that conversation with somebody 15 minutes has passed, half an hour has gone, you've spent an hour talking to them and you've never once mentioned about your faith in Christ. And there is an urgency to the gospel. Um, so, you know, we need to make sure that we are sharing Jesus as much as we can. Now, for many of us, I know that this is going to be a learning curve and, um, uh, you know, but uh, sometimes it's good to be able to do that and uh, personally, I've been sort of more challenged to, to try and do that. And, and I know that it can seem a little bit false sometimes to, to kind of, uh, if you like, weave Jesus into the conversation, just as you were talking 
uh, about the uh, the latest football match was probably tennis at the moment um, and uh, just as you were talking about somebody's serve you then turn that to about how you serve Jesus you know I mean it's 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 a bit of a tenuous link isn't it you know that you're, you're making um, uh, you know but the point is that what we're saying is that our priority when we're meeting people is to share something of the good news of Christ with them. I think we need to be uh, sensible about that. I think we need to, um, very often it, it's about using common sense in knowing when it's the right time to speak and when to be quiet. Um, sometimes it's good just to put in a one-liner, see what happens, see if they bite the hook. Uh, I was talking to uh, a friend yesterday um, and uh, you know, we, we, we got talking about um, um, she doesn't believe in God at all. Um, well, if she does, she certainly has no faith. Um, she's got quite a, you know, a different background um, of, of religion, which she's also abandoned. Um, so as far as she's concerned, there's not, not really anything out there. And the subject came up of, uh, I'm not quite sure how, I mean, this, this kind of tells you the level of the conversation we were having, I guess, um, uh, about you know, what happens uh, you know, to our bodies when we die. And, um, uh, and, and she said, um, oh, she says, you know, I don't care, she said, what happens to me. She said, uh, they can just, just burn, she said, I don't even want a coffin. She said, just stick me in a cardboard box, um, incinerate me, and then just scatter my ashes to the wind. She said, and then I'm free to go wherever I want to go. And, and that was her attitude. And, but you see, that was the opportunity that I needed then, just to get in there and just say, Do you know, I, I don't think it's what happens to our bodies that's really important. I think what's more important is what happens to our souls. Um, and uh, so, you know, it just gave us the opportunity to talk a little bit about our faith, our belief in that sense, um, without pushing it too far and pushing her away but just to share something of that importance that we have in in our belief and uh, then to leave it until the next conversation and then perhaps we'll try and pick it up again and see if we can take it a little further but it's a universal message so we shouldn't discriminate as to who we share Jesus with but when Jesus puts someone in your path if there's an opportunity there Try and take it. Um, I say, you, you don't feel guilty if you miss it, um, but just learn for the next time. Say, next time I'm going to try a bit harder. Um, tell as many people as possible about the love of Jesus. Now, it's a universal message, but as I mentioned before, that Jesus told uh, in this particular mission just to go to Israel. You'll find that in Matthew 10, 5 and 6. But that's not because God didn't want to have um, uh, the Gentiles uh, in the kingdom. It's just that for this particular time, the mission was just to Israel. So it was a sign of God's judgment upon the apostate nation. And finally, um, obedience. Uh, I want you to notice that having listened to what Jesus said, being commissioned by him to go out with the good news, that finally... They didn't just say, well, that was a lovely talk, Jesus, you just gave. We really valued the training session that we had. Jesus, I have made so many notes. I have filled three notebooks with everything that you said. And I'm going to stick them on my bookshelf. And one day I'm going to come back to those and it will remind me all over again of everything that you told us. I wonder how many of us have done that. You might not fill three notebooks. But in a sense, you have because you keep storing stuff in your head and you save it there for the next time. And then all this head knowledge comes out of how we should be and what we should do as Christians. But these guys didn't do that. Instead, they acted obediently and they went from village to village announcing the good news, the gospel and healing the sick, doing everything that Jesus told them to do. And we would also be wise not just to hear what Jesus says, but to say, and now I'm going to go and do it. I'm going to go and put it in practice. Too many of us have been sitting in church listening to the word of God for year after year after year, 
and never put it into practice in our lives. And it's a challenge to us to say that this is not supposed to be a, a book that we just fill our heads with. You know, when we were children going to um, whatever, uh, you know, if, if you did so, uh, to whatever your church provided, some Sunday school or whatever, I can remember week after week they would give us a memory verse and we'd come back the following week and have to quote the memory verse and you know we get an extra star or whatever if we manage to do it and all the stars added up to prizes at the end of the year and stuff like that and you know there's nothing wrong with that but what we were doing was filling our heads with uh, all this information and that's a good thing to do um, don't get me wrong but actually what we need to do is not just fill our heads with memory verses and have scriptures and our fingers. I know some of you are thinking, oh, if only, if only. Um, but the point is that it's not something that we just keep shut away, keep on the bookshelf, so to speak. But it's something that we live out in our lives. And so we're obedient to Christ in serving him in his kingdom. Now, each one of us is called to do different things. And you might be uh, sitting there uh, screaming inside saying, but God hasn't called me to be an evangelist. Um, that's okay. Uh, I totally accept that not everybody is called to do uh, evangelism, but we are all called to witness. Uh, it doesn't matter who we are, evangelism and, and witness, uh, it's on, on the same scale, but it's different measures of the scale. Uh, so witnessing is something that everyone does. Evangelism is something that people become very proficient in and particularly then help others to do the same. Um, but here, um, Jesus is particularly taking these sent ones in order to do that task. But as it filters down to us and we look at the principles to be applied, we can still say that we all have a duty uh, to be able to witness to what God has done in our lives and we mustn't shy away that are, are you are you ecstatic about what god has done in your life are you just so overjoyed that he saved you do you often sit back and wonder at why god should have picked you of all the people of the earth why did he hand pick you for salvation because there are millions upon millions of people who are heading into an eternity without jesus and do you know what that means? That's an eternity in hell. And if there are millions are doing that, and yet he's handpicked you and set you aside, be excited about it. Don't go around just saying, hey, look at me. You see, God loved me more than you. No, he didn't do that at all. We don't always understand the ways of God. His ways are higher than ours. His thoughts are greater than ours. But the point is that he's handpicked you, and he's handpicked you for a reason. And he wants you now to go and be a light in this dark world. It's a very dark world. You might feel like you're just a flickering candle, but go out there all the same and bring even a little bit of light into this world. And you know, the thing that you'll find is that the more that you witness, the brighter the candle will shine, the stronger the flame will get, and it will burn brightly if you persevere at it. Be encouraged in our mission sent to proclaim the kingdom of God. We've been looking at the kingdom for so long, filling our heads with all this knowledge about the kingdom. It's now time to say, let's go and do it. Let's pray.